This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Reynard. The Odyssey by Homer. Translated by Samuel Butler. Book 9. Ulysses declares himself and begins his story. The Secans, the Tophagi, and Cyclops. And Ulysses answered, King Alcinous, it is a good thing to hear a bard with such a divine voice as this man has. There is nothing better or more delightful than when a whole people make merry together, with the guests sitting orderly to listen while the table is loaded with bread and meats, and the cup-bearer draws wine and fills his cup for every man. This is indeed as fair a sight as a man can see. Now, however, since you are inclined to ask the story of my sorrows, and rekindle my own sad memories in respect of them, I do not know how to begin, nor yet how to continue and conclude my tale for the hand of heaven has been laid heavily upon me. Firstly, then, I will tell you my name, that you too may know it, and one day, if I outlive this time of sorrow, may become my guests, though I live so far away from all of you. I am Ulysses, son of Laertes, renowned among mankind for all manner of subtlety, so that my fame ascends to heaven, I live in Ithaca, where there is a high mountain called Neretum, covered with forests, and not far from it there is a group of islands very near to one another, Dilichium, Same, and the wooded island of Zacynthus. It lies squat on the horizon, all highest up in the sea toward the sunset, while the others lie away from it towards dawn. It is a rugged island, but it breeds brave men, and my eyes know none that they better love to look upon. The goddess Calypso kept me with her in her cave, and wanted me to marry her, as did also the cunning Aeneian goddess Circe. But they could neither of them persuade me, for there is nothing dearer to a man than his own country and his parents, and however splendid a home he may have in a foreign country, if it be far from father or mother, he does not care about it. Now, however, I will tell you of the many hazardous adventures which by Jove's will I met with on my return from Troy. When I had set sail thence, the wind took me first to Ismarus, which is the city of the Secans. There I sacked the town and put the people to the sword. We took their wives and also much booty, which we divided equitably amongst us, so that none might have reason to complain. I then said that we had better make off at once, but my men very foolishly would not obey me, so they stayed there drinking much wine and killing great numbers of sheep and oxen on the seashore. Meanwhile, the Secans cried out for help to other Secans, who lived in land. These were more in number and stronger and they were more skilled in the art of war, for they could fight, either from chariots or on foot as the occasion served. In the morning, therefore, they came as thick as leaves and bloom in summer, and the hand of heaven was against us, so that we were hard pressed. They set the battle in array near the ships, and the hosts aimed their bronze-shod spears at one another. So long as the day waxed, and it was still morning, we held our own against them, though they were more in number than we. But as the sun went down towards the time when men lose their oxen, the Secans got the better of us, and we lost half a dozen men from every ship we had. So we got away with those that were left. Thence we sailed onward, with sorrow in our hearts, but glad to have escaped death, though we had lost our comrades. Nor did we leave, till we had thrice invoked each one of the poor fellows who had perished by the hands of the Secans. 
Then Jove raised the north wind against us, till it blew a hurricane, so that land and sky were hidden in thick clouds, and night sprang forth out of the heavens. We let the ships run before the gale, but the force of the wind tore our sails to tatters, so we took them down for fear of shipwreck, and rowed our hardest towards the land. There we lay two days and two nights, suffering much alike from toil and distress of mind. But on the morning of the third day, we again raised our masts, set sail, and took our places, letting the wind and steersman direct our ship. I should have got home at that time unharmed, had not the north wind and the currents been against me, as I was doubling Cape Malaya, and set me off my course hard by the island of Cythera. I was driven thence by foul winds for a space of nine days upon the sea, but on the tenth day we reached the land of the lotus eaters, who live on a food that comes from a kind of flower. Here we landed to take in fresh water, and our crews got their midday meal on the shore near the ships. When they had eaten and drunk, I sent two of my company to see what manner of men the people of the place might be, and they had a third man under them. They started at once, and went about among the lotus-eaters, who did them no hurt, but gave them to eat of the lotus, which was so delicious that those who ate of it left off caring about home, and did not even want to go back and say what had happened to them but were for staying and munching lotus with the lotus-eaters, without thinking further of their return. Nevertheless, though they wept bitterly, I forced them back to the ships, and made them fast under the benches. Then I told the rest to go on board at once, lest any of them should taste of the lotus, and leave off wanting to go home. So they took their places, and smote the grey sea with their oars. We sailed hence, always in much distress, till we came to the land of the lawless and inhuman Cyclops. Now the Cyclops neither plant nor plough, but trust in providence, and live on such wheat, barley and grapes, as grow wild, without any kind of tillage, and their wild grapes yield them wine as the sun and the rain may grow them. They have no laws, nor assemblies of the people, but live in caves, on the tops of high mountains. Each is lord and master in his family, and they take no account of their neighbours. Now off their harbour there lies a wooded and fertile island, not quite close to the land of the Cyclops, but still not far. It is overrun with wild goats that breed there in great numbers, and are never disturbed by foot of man. For sportsmen, who as a rule will suffer so much hardship in forest or among mountain precipices, do not go there. Nor yet again is it ever ploughed or fed down. But it lies a wilderness, untilled and unsown from year to year, and has no living thing upon it, but only goats. For the Cyclops have no ships, nor yet shipwrights who could make ships for them. They cannot therefore go from city to city, or sail over the sea to one another's country, as people who have ships can do. If they had had these, they would have colonised the island, for it is a very good one, and would yield everything in due season. There are meadows that in some places come right down to the seashore, well watered and full of luscious grass. Grapes would do there excellently. There is level land for ploughing, and it would always yield heavily at harvest time, for the soil is deep. There is a good harbour, where no cables are wanted, nor yet anchors, nor need a ship be moored, but all one has to do is to beach one's vessel, and stay there till the wind becomes fair for putting out to sea again. At the head of the harbour there is a spring of clear water coming out of a cave, and there are poplars growing all round it. Here we entered, but so dark was the night that some god must have brought us in, for there was nothing whatever to be seen. A thick mist hung all round our ships. The moon was hidden behind a mass of clouds, so that no one could have seen the island if he had looked for it. Nor were there any breakers to tell us we were close inshore, 
before we found ourselves upon the land itself. When, however, we had beached the ships, we took down the sails, went ashore and camped upon the beach till daybreak. When the child of morning, rosy-fingered dawn, appeared, we admired the island and wandered all over it, while the nymphs, Jove's daughters, roused the wild goats that we might get some meat for our dinner. On this we fetched our spears and bows and arrows from the ships, and dividing ourselves into three bands, began to shoot the goats. Heaven sent us excellent sport. I had twelve ships with me, and each ship got nine goats, while my own ship had ten. Thus, through the live-long day, to the going down of the sun, we ate and drank our fill, and we had plenty of wine left, for each one of us had taken many jars full when we sacked the city of the Seacons. And this had not yet run out. While we were feasting, we kept turning our eyes towards the land of the Cyclops, which was hard by, and saw the smoke of their stubble fires. We could almost fancy we heard their voices and the bleating of their sheep and goats. But when the sun went down and it came on dark, we camped down upon the beach, and next morning I called a council. Stay here, my brave fellows, said I, all the rest of you, while I go with my ship and exploit these people myself. I want to see if they are uncivilized savages or a hospitable and humane race. I went on board, bidding my men to do so also, and loose the horses. So they took their places and smote the grey sea with their oars. When we got to the land, which was not far, there on the face of a cliff near the sea we saw a great cave overhung with laurels. It was a station for a great many sheep and goats, and outside there was a large yard with a high wall round it made of stones built into the ground and of trees both pine and oak. This was the abode of a huge monster who was then away from home shepherding his flocks. He would have nothing to do with other people, but led the life of an outlaw. He was a horrid creature, not like a human being at all, but resembling rather some crag that stands out boldly against the sky on the top of a high mountain. I told my men to draw the ship ashore and stay where they were, all but the twelve best among them who were to go along with myself. I also took a goatskin of sweet and black wine which had been given me by Maron, son of Euanthes, who was priest of Apollo, the patron god of Ismarus, and lived within the wooded precincts of the temple. When we were sacking the city, we respected him and spared his life, as also his wife and child. So he made me some presents of great value, seven talents of fine gold, and a bowl of silver, with twelve jars of sweet wine, unblended, and of the most exquisite flavour. Not a man nor maid in the house knew about it, but only himself, his wife, and one housekeeper. When he drank it, he mixed twenty parts of water to one of wine, and yet the fragrance from the mixing bowl was so exquisite that it was impossible to refrain from drinking. I filled a large skin with this wine, and took a wallet full of provisions with me, for my mind misgave me that I might have to deal with some savage who would be of great strength and would respect neither right nor law. We soon reached his cave, but he was out shepherding, so we went inside and took stock of all that we could see. His cheese racks were loaded with cheeses, and he had more lambs and kids than his pens could hold. They were kept in separate flocks. First, there were the hoggets, then the oldest of the younger lambs, and lastly, the very young ones, all kept apart from one another. As for his dairy, all the vessels, bowls and milk pails into which he milked were swimming with whey. When they saw all this, my men begged me to let them first steal some cheeses and make off with them to the ship. They would then return 
drive down the lambs and kids, put them on board, and sail away with them. It would have been indeed better if we had done so, but I would not listen to them, for I wanted to see the owner himself, in the hope that he might give me a present. When, however, we saw him, my poor men found him ill to deal with. We lit a fire, offered some of the cheeses in sacrifice, ate others of them, and then sat waiting till the cyclops should come in with his sheep. When he came, he brought in with him a huge load of dry firewood to light the fire for his supper, and this he flung with such a noise onto the floor of his cave that we hid ourselves for fear at the far end of the cavern. Meanwhile, he drove all the ewes inside, as well as the she-goats that he was going to milk, leaving the males, both rams and he-goats, outside in the yards. Then he rolled a huge stone to the mouth of the cave, so huge that two and twenty strong four-wheeled wagons could not be enough to draw it from its place against the doorway. When he had done so, he sat down and milked his ewes and goats all in due course, and then he let each of them have her own young. He curdled half the milk and set it aside in wicker strainers, but the other half he poured into bowls that he might drink it for his supper. When he had got through with all his work, he lit the fire and then caught sight of us, whereupon he said, Strangers, who are you? Where do you sail from? Are you traders, or do you sail the sea as rovers, with your hands against every man, and every man's hand against you? We were frightened out of our senses by his loud voice and monstrous form. But I managed to say, We are Achaeans, on our way home from Troy, and by the will of Jove, and stress of weather, we have been driven far out of our course. We are the people of Agamemnon, son of Atreus, who has won infinite renown throughout the whole world by sacking so great a city and killing so many people. We therefore humbly pray you to show us some hospitality, and otherwise make us such presents as visitors may reasonably expect. May your excellency fear the wrath of heaven, for we are your suppliants, and Jove takes all respectable travellers under his protection." for he is the avenger of all suppliants and foreigners in distress. To this he gave me but a pitiless answer. Stranger, said he, you are a fool, or else you know nothing of this country. Talk to me, indeed, about fearing the gods or shunning their anger. We Cyclops do not care about Jove or any of your blessed gods, for we are ever so much stronger than they. I shall not spare either yourself or your companions out of any regard for Jove, unless I am in the humour for doing so. And now tell me where you made your ship fast when you came on shore. Was it round the point, or is she lying straight off the land? He said this to draw me out, but I was too cunning to be caught in that way, so I answered with a lie. Neptune, said I, sent my ship on to the rocks at the far end of your country, and wrecked it. We were driven on to them from the open sea, but I and those who are with me escaped the jaws of death. The cruel wretch vouchsafed me not one word of answer, but with a sudden clutch he gripped up two of my men at once and dashed them down upon the ground as though they had been puppies. Their brains were shed upon the ground, and the earth was wet with their blood. Then he tore them limb from limb, and supped upon them. He gobbled them up like a lion in the wilderness, flesh, bones, marrow, and entrails, without leaving anything uneaten. As for us, we wept, and lifted up our hands to heaven, on seeing such a horrid sight. For we did not know what else to do. But when the Cyclops had filled his huge paunch, and had washed down his meal of human flesh with a drink of neat milk, he stretched himself full length upon the ground among his sheep, 
and went to sleep. I was at first inclined to seize my sword, draw it, and drive it into his vitals. But I reflected that if I did, we should all certainly be lost, for we should never be able to shift the stone which the monster had put in front of the door. So we stayed sobbing and sighing where we were till morning came. When the child of morning, rosy-fingered dawn, appeared, he again lit his fire, milked his goats and ewes, all quite rightly, and then let each have her own young. As soon as he had got through with all his work, he clutched up two more of my men, and began eating them for his morning's meal. Presently, with the utmost ease, he rolled the stone away from the door, and drove out his sheep. But he at once put it back again, as easily as though he were merely clapping the lid on to a quiver full of arrows. As soon as he had done so, he shouted and cried, Shoo! Shoo! after his sheep, to drive them onto the mountain. So I was left to scheme some way of taking my revenge, and covering myself with glory. In the end, I deemed it would be the best plan to do as follows. The Cyclops had a great club, which was lying near one of the sheep pens. It was of green olive wood, and he had cut it, intending it to use for a staff, as soon as it should be dry. It was so huge that we could only compare it to the mast of a twenty-oared merchant vessel of large burden, and able to venture out into open sea. I went up to this club, and cut off about six feet of it. I then gave this piece to the men, and told them to fine it evenly off at one end, which they proceeded to do, and lastly I brought it to a point myself, charring the end in the fire to make it harder. When I had done this, I hid it under dung, which was lying about all over the cave, and told the men to cast lots, which of them should venture along with myself to lift it, and bore it into the monster's eye while he was asleep. The lot fell upon the very four whom I should have chosen, and I myself made five. In the evening the wretch came back from shepherding, and drove his flocks into the cave, this time driving them all inside, and not leaving any in the yards. I suppose some fancy must have taken him, or a god must have prompted him to do so. As soon as he had put the stone back in its place against the door, he sat down, milked his ewes and his goats all quite rightly, and then let each have her own young. When he had got through with all this work, he gripped up two more of my men, and made his supper of them. So I went up to him, with an ivy wood bowl of black wine in my hands. Look here, Cyclops, said I, you have been eating a great deal of man's flesh, so take this and drink some wine, that you may see what kind of liquor we had on board my ship. I was bringing it to you as a drink offering, in the hope that you would take compassion upon me and further me on my way home. Whereas all you do is go on ramping and raving most intolerably, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. How can you expect people to come see you any more if you treat them in this way? He then took the cup and drank. He was so delighted with the taste of the wine that he begged me for another bowlful. Be so kind, he said, as to give me some more, and tell me your name at once. I want to make you a present that you will be glad to have. We have wine even in this country, for our soil grows grapes, and the sun ripens them. But this drinks like nectar and ambrosia all in one. I then gave him some more. Three times did I fill the bowl for him, and three times did he drain it without thought or heed. Then, when I saw that the wine had got into his head, I said to him as plausibly as I could, Cyclops, you ask my name, and I will tell it to you. Give me, therefore, the present you promised me. My name is No Man. This is what my father and mother and my friends have always called me. But the cruel wretch said, Then I will eat all No Man's comrades before No Man himself. 
and will keep no man for the last. This is the present that I will make him. As he spoke, he reeled and fell sprawling face upwards on the ground. His great neck hung heavily backwards, and a deep sleep told upon him. Presently he turned sick, and threw up both wine and the gobbets of human flesh on which he had been gorging, for he was very drunk. Then I thrust the beam of wood far into the embers to heat it, and encouraged my men, lest any of them should turn faint-hearted. When the wood, green though it was, was about to blaze, I drew it out of the fire glowing with heat, and my men gathered round me, for heaven had filled their hearts with courage. We drove the sharp end of the beam into the monster's eye, and bearing upon it with all my weight, I kept turning it round and round as though I were boring a hole in a ship's plank with an auger, which two men with a wheel and strap can keep on turning as long as they choose. Even thus did we bore the red-hot beam into his eye, till the boiling blood bubbled all over it as we worked it round and round, so that the steam from the burning eyeball scalded his eyelids and eyebrows, and the roots of the eye sputtered in the fire. As a blacksmith plunges an axe or hatchet into cold water to temper it, for it is this that gives strength to the iron, and it makes a great hiss as he does so. Even thus did the cyclops' eye hiss round the beam of olive wood, and his hideous yells made the cave ring again. We ran away in a fright, but he plucked the beam, all besmirched with gore from his eye, and hurled it from him in a frenzy of rage and pain, shouting as he did so to the other cyclops who lived on the bleak headlands near him. So they gathered from all quarters round his cave when they heard him crying, and asked him what was the matter with him. "'What ails you, Polyphemus?' said they. "'That you make such a noise, breaking the stillness of the night, and preventing us from being able to sleep? "'Surely no man is carrying off your sheep. "'Surely no man is trying to kill you, either by fraud or by force.' But Polyphemus shouted to them from inside the cave, No man is killing me by fraud! No man is killing me by force! Then, said they, if no man is attacking you, you must be ill. When Jove makes people ill, there is no help for it, and you had better pray to your father Neptune. Then they went away, and I laughed inwardly at the success of my clever stratagem. But the Cyclops, groaning and in an agony of pain, felt about with his hands till he found the stone and took it from the door. Then he sat in the doorway and stretched his hands in front of it to catch any one going out with the sheep, for he thought I might be foolish enough to attempt this. As for myself, I kept on puzzling to think how I could best save my own life and those of my companions. I schemed and schemed, as one who knows that his life depends on it, for the danger was very great. In the end, I deemed that this plan would be the best. The male sheep were well grown, and carried a heavy black fleece. So I bound them noiselessly in threes together, with some of the withies on which the wicked monster used to sleep. There was to be a man under the middle sheep, and the two on either side were to cover him, so that there were three sheep to each man. As for myself, there was a ram finer than any of the others, so I caught hold of him by the back, ensconced myself in the thick wool under his belly, and hung on patiently to his fleece, face upwards, keeping a firm hold on it all the time. Thus then did we wait in great fear of mind, till morning came. But when the child of morning, rosy-fingered dawn, appeared, the male sheep hurried out to feed, while the ewes remained bleating about the pens, waiting to be milked, for their udders were full to bursting. But their master, in spite of all his pain, 
felt the backs of all the sheep as they stood upright, without being sharp enough to find out that the men were underneath their bellies. As the ram was going out, last of all, heavy with its fleeces and with the weight of my crafty self, Polyphemus laid hold of it and said, My good ram, what is it that makes you the last to leave my cave this morning? You are not wont to let the ewes go before you, but lead the mob with a run, whether to flowery mead or bubbling fountain, and are the first to come home again at night. But now you lag last of all. Is it because you know your master has lost his eye, and are sorry because that wicked no-man and his horrid crew has got him down on his drink and blinded him? But I will have his life yet. If you could understand and talk, you would tell me where the wretch is hiding, and I would dash his brains upon the ground till they flew all over the cave. I should thus have some satisfaction for the harm this no good no man has done me. As he spoke, he drove the ram outside. But when we were a little way out from the cave and yards, I first got from under the ram's belly, and then freed my comrades. As for the sheep, which were very fat, by constantly heading them in the right direction, we managed to drive them down to the ship. The crew rejoiced greatly at seeing those of us who had escaped death, but wept for the others whom the Cyclops had killed. However, I made signs to them by nodding and frowning that they were to hush their crying, and told them to get all the sheep on board at once and put out to sea. So they went aboard, took their places, and smote the grey sea with their oars. Then, when I had got as far out as my voice would reach, I began to jeer at the Cyclops. Cyclops, said I, you should have taken better measure of your man before eating up his comrades in your cave. You wretch, eat up your visitors in your own house, you might have known that your sin would find you out, and now Jove and the other gods have punished you. He got more and more furious as he heard me. So he tore the top from off a high mountain, and flung it just in front of my ship, so that it was within a little of hitting the end of the rudder. The sea quaked as the rock fell into it, and the wash of the wave it raised carried us back towards the mainland and forced us towards the shore. But I snatched up a long pole, and kept the ship off, making signs to my men by nodding my head, that they must row for their lives. Whereupon they laid out with a will. When we had got twice as far as we were before, I was for jeering at the Cyclops again, but the men begged and prayed of me to hold my tongue. Do not, they exclaimed, be mad enough to provoke this savage creature further. He has thrown one rock at us already, which drove us back again to the mainland, and we made sure it had been the death of us. If it had then heard any further sound of voices, he would have pounded our heads and our ship's timbers into a jelly with the rugged rocks he would have heaved at us, for he can throw them a long way. But I would not listen to them, and shouted out to him in my rage, Cyclops, if any one asks you who it was that put out your eye and spoiled your beauty, say it was the valiant warrior Ulysses, son of Laertes, who lives in Ithaca. On this he groaned and cried out, Alas, alas, then the old prophecy about me is coming true. There was a prophet here at one time, a man both brave and of great stature. Telemus, son of Eurymus, who was an excellent seer, and did all the prophesying for the Cyclops, till he grew old. He told me that all this would happen to me some day, and said I should use my sight by the hand of Ulysses. I have been all along expecting someone of imposing presence and superhuman strength. Whereas, he turns out to be a little 
insignificant weakling, who has managed to blind my eye by taking advantage of me in my drink. Come here then, Ulysses, that I may make you presents to show my hospitality, and urge Neptune to help you forward on your journey. For Neptune and I are father and son. He, if he so will, shall heal me, which no one else, neither God nor man, can do. Then I said, I wish I could be as sure of killing you outright and sending you down to the house of Hades, as I am that it will take more than Neptune to cure that eye of yours. On this he lifted up his hands to the ferment of heaven and prayed, saying, Hear me, great Neptune, if I am indeed your own true begotten son, grant that Ulysses may never reach his home alive, or if he must get back to his friends at last, let him do so late and in sore plight after losing all his men. Let him reach his home in another man's ship and find trouble in his house. Thus did he pray. And Neptune heard his prayer. Then he picked up a rock much larger than the first, swung it aloft, and hurled it with prodigious force. It fell just short of the ship, but was within a little of hitting the end of the rudder. The sea quaked as the rock fell into it, and the wash of the wave it raised drove us onwards on our way towards the shore of the island. When at last we got to the island, where we had left the rest of our ships, we found our comrades lamenting us and anxiously awaiting our return. We ran our vessel upon the sands and got out of her onto the seashore. We also landed the cyclops' sheep and divided them equitably amongst us so that none might have reason to complain. As for the ram, my companions agreed that I should have it as an extra share. So I sacrificed it on the seashore, and burned its thigh bones to Jove, who is the lord of all. But he heeded not my sacrifice, and only thought how he might destroy both my ships and my comrades. Thus through the live-long day, to the going down of the sun, we feasted our fill on meat and drink. But when the sun went down, and it came on dark, we camped upon the beach, when the child of morning, rosy-fingered dawn, appeared, I bade my men on board and loose the horses. Then they took their places and smote the grey sea with their oars. So we sailed on with sorrow in our hearts, but glad to have escaped death, though we had lost our comrades. End of Book Nine this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Reynard. The Odyssey by Homer. Translated by Samuel Butler. Book 10. Aeolus the Lestrigenes, Circe. Thence we went on to the Aeolian Islands, where lives Aeolus, son of Hippotas, dear to the immortal gods. It is an island that floats, as it were, upon the sea, iron bound with a wall that girds it. Now Aeolus has six daughters and six lusty sons. So he made the sons marry the daughters, and they all live with their dear father and mother, feasting and enjoying every conceivable kind of luxury. All day long the atmosphere of the house is loaded with the savour of roasting meats, till it groans again, yard and all. But by night they sleep on their well-made bedsteads, each with his own wife between the blankets. These were the people among whom we had now come. Aeolus entertained me for a whole month, asking me questions all the time about Troy, 
the Argi fleet, and the return of the Achaeans. I told him exactly how everything had happened, and when I said I must go, and asked him to further me on my way, he made no sort of difficulty, but set about doing so at once. Moreover, he flayed me a prime ox-hide to hold the way of the roaring winds, which he shut up in the hide, as in a sack, for Jove had made him captain over the winds, and he could stir or still each one of them according to his own pleasure. He put the sack in the ship, and bound the mouth so tightly with a silver thread that not even a breath of a side wind could blow from any quarter. The west wind, which was fair for us, did he alone let blow as it chose. But it all came to nothing, for we were lost through our own folly. Nine days and nine nights did we sail, and on the tenth day our native land showed on the horizon. We got so close in that we could see the stubble fires burning, and I, being then dead beat, fell into a light sleep, for I had never let the rudder out of my own hands, that we might get home the faster. On this the men fell to talking amongst themselves, and said I was bringing back gold and silver in the sack that Aeolus had given me. Bless my heart, would one turn to his neighbour, saying, how this man gets honoured and makes friends to whatever city or country he may go. See what fine prizes he is taking home from Troy, while we, who have travelled just as far as he have, come back with hands as empty as we set out with. And now Aeolus has given him ever so much more. Quick, let us see what it all is, and how much gold and silver there is in the sack he gave him. Thus they talked, and evil counsels prevailed. They loosed the sack, whereupon the wind flew howling forth, and raised a storm that carried us weeping out to sea and away from our own country. Then I awoke, and knew not whether to throw myself into the sea, or to live on and make the best of it. But I bore it, covered myself up, and lay down in the ship, while the men lamented bitterly as the fierce winds bore our fleet back to the Aeolian island. When we reached it, we went ashore to take in water, and dined hard by the ships. Immediately after dinner, I took a herald and one of my men, and went straight to the house of Aeolus, where I found him feasting with his wife and family. So we sat down as suppliants on the threshold, they were astounded when they saw us, and said, Ulysses, what brings you here? What god has been ill-treating you? We took great pains to further you on your way home to Ithaca, or wherever it was that you wanted to go to. Thus did they speak. But I answered sorrowfully, My men have undone me. They and cruel sleep have ruined me. My friends... Med me this mischief, for you can if you will. I spoke as movingly as I could, but they said nothing, till their father answered, Vilest of mankind, get you gone at once out of the islands. Him whom heaven hates will I in no wise help. Be off, for you came here as one aboard of heaven, and with these words he sent me sorrowing from his door. Thence we sailed sadly on, till the men were worn out with long and fruitless rowing, for there was no longer any wind to help them. Six days, night and day, did we toil, and on the seventh day we reached the rocky stronghold of Lamus, Telephilus, the city of Lestrogenians, where the shepherd, who is driving in his sheep and goats to be milked, salutes him who is driving out his flock, to feed, and this last answers the salute. In that country a man who could do without sleep might earn double wages, 
one as a herdsman of cattle, and another as a shepherd, for they work much the same by night as they do by day. When we reached the harbour, we found it landlocked under steep cliffs, with a narrow entrance between two headlands. My captains took all their ships inside, and made them fast close to one another, for there was never so much as a breath of wind inside, but it was always dead calm. I kept my own ship outside, and moored it to a rock at the very end of the point. Then I climbed a high rock to reconnoitre, but could see no sign neither of man nor cattle, only some smoke rising from the ground. So I sent two of my company with an attendant to find out what sort of people the inhabitants were. The men, when they got on shore, followed a level road by which the people draw their firewood from the mountains into the town, till presently they met a young woman who had come outside to fetch water, and who was daughter to a Lestragonian named Antiphates. She was going to the fountain Artasia, from which the people bring in their water, and when my men had come close up to her, they asked her who the king of that country might be, and over what kind of people he ruled. So she directed them to her father's house. But when they got there, they found his wife to be a giantess as huge as a mountain, and they were horrified at the sight of her. She at once called her husband Antiphates from the place of assembly, and forthwith he set about killing my men. He snatched up one of them, and began to make his dinner of him, then and there, whereon the other two ran back to the ships as fast as ever they could. But Antiphates raised a hue and cry after them, and thousands of sturdy Lestragonians sprang up from every quarter. Ogres, not men! They threw vast rocks at us from the cliffs, as though they had been mere stones, and I heard the horrid sound of the ships crunching up against one another, and the death cries of my men, as the Lestragonians speared them like fishes, and took them home to eat them. While they were thus killing my men within the harbour, I drew my sword, cut the cable of my own ship, and told my men to row with all their might, if they too would not fare like the rest. So they laid out for their lives, and we were thankful enough when we got into open waters, out of reach of the rocks they hurled at us. As for the others, there was not one of them left. Thence we sailed sadly on, glad to have escaped death, though we had lost our comrades, and came to the Aeneian island, where Circe lives, a great and cunning goddess, who is own sister to the magician Aetes, for they are both children of the sun by Perse, who is daughter to Oceanus. We brought our ship into a safe harbour without a word, for some god guided us thither, and having landed we lay there for two days and two nights, worn out in body and mind. When the morning of the third day came, I took my spear and my sword, and went away from the ship to reconnoitre, and see if I could discover signs of human handiwork, or hear the sound of voices. Climbing to the top of a high lookout, I espied the smoke of Circe's house, rising upwards amid a dense forest of trees. And when I saw this, I doubted whether, having seen the smoke, I would not go at once and find out more. But in the end, I deemed it best to go back to the ship, give the men their dinners, and send some of them instead of going myself. When I had nearly got back to the ship, some god took pity upon my solitude, and sent a fine antlered stag right into the middle of my path. He was coming down his pasture in the forest to drink of the river, for the heat of the sun drove him, and as he passed I struck him in the middle of the back. The bronze point of the spear went clean through him, and he lay groaning in the dust until the life went out of him. Then I set my foot upon him, drew my spear from the wound, and laid it down. 
I also gathered rough grass and rushes and twisted them into a fathom or so of good stout rope, with which I bound the four feet of the noble creature together. Having so done, I hung him round my neck and walked back to the ship leaning upon my spear, for the stag was much too big for me to be able to carry him on my shoulder, steadying him with one hand. As I threw him down in front of the ship, I called the men and spoke cheeringly man by man to each of them. Look here, my friends, said I. We are not going to die so much before our time after all. And at any rate, we will not starve so long as we have got something to eat and drink on board. On this they uncovered their heads upon the seashore and admired the stag, for he was indeed a splendid fellow. Then, when they had feasted their eyes upon him sufficiently, they washed their hands and began to cook him for dinner. Thus, through the live-long day to the going down of the sun, we stayed there eating and drinking our fill. But when the sun went down and it came on dark, we camped upon the seashore. When the child of morning, rosy-fingered dawn, appeared, I called a council and said, My friends, we are in very great difficulties. Listen therefore to me. We have no idea where the sun either sets or rises, so that we do not even know east from west. I see no way out of it. Nevertheless, we must try and find one. We are certainly on an island, for I went as high as I could this morning and saw the sea reaching all round it to the horizon. It lies low, but towards the middle I saw smoke rising from out of a thick forest of trees. Their hearts sank as they heard me, for they remembered how they had been treated by the Lestragonian Antiphates and by the savage ogre Polyphemus. They wept bitterly in their dismay, but there was nothing to be got by crying. So I divided them into two companies and set a captain over each. I gave one company to Eurylochus, while I took command of the other myself. Then we cast lots in a helmet, and the lot fell upon Eurylochus. So he set out with his twenty-two men, and they wept, as also did we who were left behind. When they reached Circe's house, they found it built of cut stones, on a site that could be seen from far, in the middle of the forest. There were wild mountain wolves and lions prowling all round it. Poor bewitched creatures, whom she had tamed by her enchantments and drugged into subjection. They did not attack my men, but wagged their great tails, fawned upon them and rubbed their noses lovingly against them, as hounds crowd round their master when they see him coming from dinner, for they know he will bring them something. Even so did these wolves and lions with their great claws fawn upon my men. But the men were terribly frightened at seeing such strange creatures. Presently they reached the gates of the goddess's house, and as they stood there they could hear Circe within, singing most beautifully as she worked at her loom, making a web so fine, so soft, and of such dazzling colours as no one but a goddess could weave. On this Polites, whom I valued and trusted much more than any other of my men, said, There is someone inside working at a loom and singing most beautifully. The whole place resounds with it. Let us call her and see whether she is woman or goddess. They called her, and she came down, unfastened the door and bade them enter. They, thinking no evil, followed her, all except Eurylochus, who suspected mischief and stayed outside. When she had got them into her house, she set them upon benches and seats and mixed them a mess with cheese, honey, meal and pramnian wine. But she drugged it with wicked poisons to make them forget their homes. And when they had, had drunk, she turned them into pigs by a stroke of her wand shut them up in her pigsties. They were like pigs, head, hair and all, and they grunted just as pigs do, but their senses were the same as before, 
and they remembered everything. Thus then were they shut up, squealing, and Circe threw them some acorns and beech masts, such as pigs eat. But Eurylochus hurried back to tell me about the sad fate of our comrades. He was so overcome with dismay, that though he tried to speak, he could find no words to do so. His eyes filled with tears, and he could only sob and sigh, till at last we forced his story out of him, and he told us what had happened to the others. We went, said he, as you told us, through the forest, and in the middle of it there was a fine house built with cut stones in a place that could be seen from far. There we found a woman, or else she was a goddess, working at her loom and singing sweetly. So the men shouted to her and called her, whereon she at once came down, opened the door and invited us in. The others did not suspect any mischief, so they followed her into the house. But I stayed where I was, for I thought there might be some treachery. From that moment I saw them no more, for not one of them ever came out, though I sat a long time watching for them. Then I took my sword of bronze and slung it over my shoulders. I also took my bow and told Eurylochus to come back with me and show me the way. But he laid hold of me with both his hands and spoke piteously, saying, Sir, do not force me to go with you, but let me stay here, for I know you will not bring one of them back with you, nor even return alive yourself. Let us rather see if we cannot escape, at any rate, with the few that are left us, for we may, we may still save our lives. Stay where you are, then, I answered, eating and drinking at the ship, but I must go for I am most urgently bound to do so. With this I left the ship and went up inland. When I got through the charmed grove and was near the great house of the enchantress Circe, I met Mercury with his golden wand, disguised as a young man in the heyday of his youth and beauty, with a down just coming upon his face. He came up to me and took my hand within his own, saying, My poor unhappy man, Whither are you going over this mountain top, alone and without knowing the way? Your men are shut up in Circe's pigsties, like so many wild boars in their lairs. You surely do not fancy that you can set them free. I can tell you that you will never get back, and will have to stay there with the rest of them. But never mind, I will protect you and get you out of your difficulty. Take this herb, which is one of great virtue and keep it about you when you go to Circe's house. It will be a talisman to you against every kind of mischief. And I will tell you of all the wicked witchcraft that Circe will try to practice upon you. She will mix a mess for you to drink, and she will drug the meal with which she makes it, but she will not be able to charm you, for the virtue of the herb that I shall give you will prevent her spells from working. I will tell you all about it. When Circe strikes you with her wand, draw your sword and spring upon her as though you were going to kill her. She will then be frightened, and will desire you to go to bed with her. On this you must not point a blank refuse her, for you want her to set your companions free, and to take good care also of yourself. But you must make her swear solemnly by all the blessed gods that she will plot no further mischief against you or else when she has got you naked, she will unman you and make you fit for nothing. As he spoke, he pulled the herb out of the ground and showed me what it was like. The root was black, while the flower was as white as milk. The gods call it moly, and mortal men cannot uproot it, but the gods can do whatever they like. Then Mercury went back to high Olympus, passing over the wooded island, but I fared onward to the house of Circe, and my heart was clouded with care as I walked along. When I got to the gates, I stood there and called the goddess, and as soon as she heard me, she came down, opened the door, and asked me to come in. So I followed her, much troubled in my mind. She set me on a richly decorated seat, inlaid with silver. There was a footstool also under my feet. 
and she mixed the mess in a golden goblet for me to drink, but she drugged it, for she meant me mischief. When she had given it me, and I had drunk it without its charming me, she struck me with her wand. There now, she cried, be off to the pigsty and make your lair with the rest of them. But I rushed at her with my sword drawn, as though I would kill her, whereupon she fell with a loud scream, clasped my knees and spoke piteously, saying, Who and whence are you? From what place and people have you come? How can it be that my drugs have no power to charm you? Never yet was a man able to stand so much as a taste of the herb I gave you. You must be spell-proof. Surely you can be none other than the bold hero Ulysses, who Mercury always said would come here some day with his ship while on his way home from Troy. So be it then. Sheath your sword and let us go to bed that we may make friends and learn to trust each other. And I answered, Sir, say, how can you expect me to be friendly with you when you have just been turning all my men into pigs? And now that you have got me here myself, you mean me mischief when you ask me to go to bed with you, and will unman me and make me unfit for nothing. I shall certainly not consent to go to bed with you unless you will first take your solemn oath to plot no further harm against me. So she swore at once, as I had told her, and when she had completed her oath, then I went to bed with her. Meanwhile, her four servants, who are her housemaids, set about their work. They are the children of the groves and fountains, and of the holy waters that run down into the sea. One of them spread a fair purple cloth over a seat, and laid a carpet underneath it. Another brought tables of silver up to the seats, and set them with baskets of gold. A third mixed some sweet wine with water in a silver bowl, and put golden cups upon the tables, while the fourth brought in water and set it to boil in a large cauldron over a good fire which she had lighted. When the water in the cauldron was boiling, she poured cold into it till it was just as I liked it, and then she set me in a bath and began washing me from the cauldron about the head and shoulders, to take the tire and stiffness out of my limbs. As soon as she had done washing me and anointing me with oil, she had arrayed me in a good cloak and shirt, and led me to a richly decorated seat, inlaid with silver. There was a footstool also underneath my feet. A maidservant then brought me water in a beautiful golden ewer, and poured it into a silver basin for me to wash my hands and she drew a clean table beside me. An upper servant bought me bread, and offered me many things, of what there was in the house. And then Circe bade me eat. But I would not, and sat without heating what was before me, still moody and suspicious. When Circe saw me sitting there without eating, and in great grief, she came to me and said, Ulysses, why do you sit like that, as though you were dumb, gnawing at your own heart, and refusing both meat and drink? Is it that you are still suspicious? You ought not to be, for I have already sworn solemnly that I will not hurt you. And I said, Circe, no man with any sense of what is right can think of either eating or drinking in your house until you have set his friends free and let him see them. If you want me to eat and drink, you must free my men, and bring them to me, that I may see them with my own eyes. When I had said this, she went straight through the court, with her wand in her hand, and opened the pigsty doors. My men came out like so many prime hogs, and stood looking at her. But she went among them, and anointed each with a second drug, whereupon the bristles that the bad drug had given them fell off, and they became men again, younger than they were before, and much taller and better looking. They knew me at once, seized me, each of them by the hand, and wept for joy, till the whole house itself was filled with the sound of their halloa bellowing. And Circe herself was so sorry for them, that she came up to me and said, Ulysses, noble son of Laertes, go back at once to the sea where you have left your ship, and first draw it on to the land. 
then hide all your ship's gear and property in some cave, and come back here with your men. I agreed to this, so I went back to the seashore, and found the men at the ship weeping and wailing most piteously. When they saw me, the silly blubbering fellows began frisking round me as calves break out and gamble round their mothers, when they see them coming home to be milked, after have been feeding all day, and the homestead re resounds with their lowing. They seemed as glad to see me as though they had got back to their own rugged Ithaca, where they had been born and bred. Sir, said the affectionate creatures, we are as glad to see you back as though you had got safe home to Ithaca. But tell us all about the fate of our comrades. I spoke comforting to them, to them and said, We must draw our ship onto the land and hide the ship's gear with all our property in some cave. Then come with me, all of you, as fast as you can to Circe's house, where you will find your comrades eating and drinking in the midst of great abundance. On this, the men would have come with me at once, but Eurylochus tried to hold them back and said, Alas, poor wretches that we are, what will become of us? Rush not on your ruin by going to the house of Circe, who will turn us all into pigs or wolves or lions, and we shall have to keep guard over her house. Remember how the Cyclops treated us when our comrades went inside his cave, and Ulysses with them. It was all through his sheer folly that those men lost their lives. When I heard him, I was in two minds whether or no to draw the keen blade that hung by my sturdy thigh, and cut his head off in spite of his being a near relation of my own. But the men interceded for him and said, Sir, if it may so be, let this fellow stay here and mind the ship, but take the rest of us with you to Circe's house. On this we all went inland, and Eurylochus was not left behind after all, but came on too, for he was frightened by the severe reprimand that I had given him. Meanwhile, Circe had been seeing that the men who had been left behind were washed and anointed with olive oil. She had also given them woollen cloaks and shirts, and when we came we found them all comfortably at dinner in her house. As soon as the men saw each other face to face and knew one another, they wept for joy and cried aloud till the whole palace rang again. Thereon Circe came up to me and said, Ulysses, noble son of Laertes, tell your men to leave off crying. I know how much you have all of you suffered at sea, and how ill you have fared among cruel savages on the mainland. But that is over now, so stay here and eat and drink, till you are once more as strong and hearty as you were when you left Ithaca. For at present you are weakened both in body and mind. You keep all the time thinking of the hardships you have suffered during your travels, so that you have no more cheerfulness left in you. Thus did she speak, and we assented. We stayed with Circe for a whole twelve month, feasting upon an untold quantity both of meat and wine. But when the year had passed, in the waning of moons, and the long days had come round, my men called me apart and said, Sir, it is time you began to think about going home, if so be you are to be spared to see your house and native country at all. Thus did they speak, and I assented. Thereon, through the live-long day, to the going down of the sun, we feasted our fill on meat and wine. But when the sun went down, and it came on dark, the men laid themselves down to sleep in the covered cloisters. I, however, after I had got into bed with Circe, besought her by her knees, and the goddess listened to what I had got to say. Circe, said I, please to keep the promise you made me about furthering me on my homeward voyage. I want to get back, and so do my men. They are always pestering me with their complaints as soon as ever your back is turned. And the goddess answered, Ulysses, noble son of Laertes, you shall none of you stay here any longer if you do not want to. But there is another journey which you have got to take before you can sail homewards. You must go to the house of Hades and of dead Proserpine to consult the ghost of the blind Theban prophet Tiresias, 
whose reason is still unshaken. To him alone has Proserpine left his understanding, even in death, for the other ghosts flit about aimlessly. I was dismayed when I heard this. I sat up in bed and wept, and would gladly have lived no longer to see the light of the sun. But presently, when I was tired of weeping and tossing myself about, I said, Who shall guide me upon this voyage? For the house of Hades is a port that no ship can reach. You will want no guide, she answered. Raise your mast, set your white sails, sit quite still, and the north wind will blow you there of itself. When your ship has traversed the waters of Oceanus, you will reach the fertile shore of Proserpine's country, with its groves of tall poplars and willows that shed their fruit untimely. Here beach your ship upon the shore of Oceanus, and go straight on to the dark abode of Hades. You will find it near the place where the rivers Pyriphlegathon and Cocytus, which is a branch of the river Styx, flow into Acheron, and you will see a rock near it, just where the two roaring rivers run into one another. When you have reached this spot, as I now tell you, dig a trench a cubit or so in length, breadth and depth, and pour into it, as a drink offering to all the dead, first, honey mixed with milk, then wine, and in the third place, water, sprinkling white barley meal over the whole. Moreover, you must offer many prayers to the poor, feeble ghosts, and promise them that when you get back to Ithaca, you will sacrifice a barren heifer to them, the best you have, and will load the pyre with good things. More particularly, you must promise that Tiresias shall have a black sheep all to himself, and the finest in all your flocks. When you shall have thus besought the ghosts with your prayers, offer them a ram and a black ewe, bending their heads towards Erebus, but yourself turn away from them as though you would make towards the river. On this, many dead men's ghosts will come to you, and you must tell your men to skin the two sheep that you have just killed, and offer them as a burnt sacrifice, with prayers to Hades and to Proserpine. Then draw your sword and sit there, so as to prevent any other poor ghost from coming near the spilt blood before Tiresias shall have answered your questions. The seer will presently come to you, and will tell you about your voyage, what stages you are to make, and how you are to sail the sea so as to reach your home. It was daybreak by the time she had done speaking, so she dressed me in my shirt and cloak. As for herself, she threw a beautiful light gossamer fabric over her shoulders, fastening it with a golden girdle around her waist, and she covered her head with a mantle. Then I went about among the men everywhere all over the house, and spoke kindly to each of them, man by man. You must not lie sleeping here any longer, said I to them. We must be going, for Circe has told me all about it. And on this they did as I bade them. Even so, however, I did not get them away without misadventure. We had with us a certain youth named Elpenor, not very remarkable for sense or courage, who had got drunk and was lying on the housetop away from the rest of the men, to sleep off his liquor in the cool. When he heard the noise of the men bustling about, he jumped up on a sudden and forgot all about coming down by the main staircase. So he tumbled right off the roof and broke his neck, and his soul went down to the house of Hades. When I had got the men together, I said to them, You think you are about to start home again, but Circe has explained to me that instead of this, we have got to go to the house of Hades and Proserpine to consult the ghost of the Theban prophet Tiresias. The men were broken-hearted as they heard me, and threw themselves on the ground, groaning and tearing their hair. But they did not mend matters by crying. When we reached the seashore, weeping and lamenting our fate, Circe bought the ram and the ewe, and we made them fast hard by the ship. 
she passed through the midst of us without our knowing it, for who can see the comings and goings of a god, if the god does not wish to be seen? End of Book 10